dear guests, uh, it is my privilege to uh, introduce Ada Jonat, Professor Ada Jonat. Uh, she got Nobel Prize in 2009 for her studies on the structure and function of the ribosome. She is the first Israeli woman to win the Nobel Prize out of 10 Israeli Nobel laureates, the first woman from the Middle East to win a Nobel Prize in the sciences, and the first woman in 45 years to win the Nobel Prize for chemistry. Ada Yonat is the current director of the Kimmelman Center for Biomolecular Structure and Assembly of the Weizmann Institute of Science. She graduated uh, the Hebrew University, earned PhD at Weizmann, and was a postdoc at the Carnegie Mellon University in, in MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. During 1986-2004, she also headed Max Planck Research Unit in Hamburg, Germany. She's a member of the Israeli, European, Korean, US National Academy of Sciences, holds honorary doctorates from several universities, including Oxford, New York University, and almost all Israeli universities. The number of her awards are countless, to mention just a few, the first European Crystallography Prize, Israel Prize, the Wolf Prize, the Linus Pauling Medal, the Albert Einstein World Award, the India Prime Minister Medal, and of course, the Nobel Prize. Other units research is focused on understanding the mechanism of protein biosynthesis by ribosomal crystallography, a research line she pioneered over 20 years ago despite considerable skepticism of the international scientific community. For enabling ribosomal crystallography, she introduced the novel technique, cryo-bio-crystallography, which became routine in structural biology and allowed intricate projects otherwise considered formidable. She determined the complete high-resolution high structures of both ribosomal subunits and discovered within the otherwise asymmetric ribosome the universal symmetrical region that provides the framework and navigates the process of polypeptide polymerization. Additionally, she elucidated the modes of action of over 20 different antibiotics targeting the ribosome, illuminated the mechanism of drug resistance and synergies, thus paving the way for structure-based drug design. Please, Professor. This is my modified a title. It's not exactly what's written. And the reason for modification was uh, were several discussions I had yesterday and today with young scientists that wanted much more to know what was my driving force and how did everything work and what, what are the fruits of my driving force. So I thought I will talk more about it you will get something about antibiotics. So, I was curious. Actually, I want to cite somebody much more important than me that said, I have no special talent. I am only passionately curious. This is what Albert Einstein said about himself. And similar to him, curiosity and passion brought me to where I am now. And I think that for young people, especially young students, it's, it, it's uh, the lesson I want to give. Okay, once you are ready. Didn't you hear me at the, at the last, last row? Did you hear? Yeah. Do you hear now? No, not you, you're close. The last row. Anybody from the last row can lift his finger? Okay, so they hear me. <laughs> So it, it, it's a, a very, very much pleasure to work on hard problems, but with curiosity and passion. You forget that it's hard. You just enjoy it. So I grew up in poverty, three f families in a four-room apartment in Jerusalem. No wonder that I was experimenting at the corner of the balcony. Everything else was full of people. Three families, with children and so on, one toilet, one, one kitchen, no other place by the corner of the balcony. 
And when I was five, I wanted to see what is the height of the balcony, the ceiling of the balcony. And I performed an experiment in which I piled up many furniture. I still didn't reach the ceiling, so I climbed on them. I thought if I stand and I put up my hand, maybe I reach the ceiling. The result of this experiment is well, very well uh, reported. A severely broken hand that I got when I fell down from the balcony to floors. So you can see, can you see the, the cast? This is me. <laughs> so instead of seeing where the ceiling is, I fell to the backyard. I grew up a little bit and I was interested in evaporation, evaporation of liquids. Which compound is faster, water or kerosene? I'm not sure you know what is kerosene, but it's a not refined benzene that we use for uh, cars today. At that time, kerosene was used, at least for poor families, in order to warm up water. So I wanted to see what, is, what goes first, what will reach first the second, the second day. Um, battle or sorry, glass. This I also did on the on the corner of the balcony. My father was smoking, and of course my mother told him to smoke only on the balcony because of obvious reasons. The result of this experiment is not as well documented, but it was fire. <laughs> so this this is a. Probably I did many more experiments, but those are those that I, I was told about, or, see? And actually, not all the experiments led to catastrophes. <laughs> Some were smoothly performed. So regardless, smooth or not smooth, catastrophe, results, I kept ex exploring. And when I understood a little bit more and read a bit more, the translation of the genetic code, the translation of the instructions that are embedded in the DNA, in the genes, into the cell workers, the proteins, excited me very much. And I focused on it, even before I worked in a very, very defined part of it, of the whole process. So let me tell you a little bit why I was excited about it, and actually I'm still excited. Doesn't matter, it's still interesting. So proteins, for those that don't know what it is, and I guess that you do, all of you, are performing nearly all the essential functions of life. There are, there are proteins that are signaling or regulating, like insulin, for instance. There are transport proteins, like hemoglobin. I'm specifically using names that you may know. Some of them are structural proteins, like the proteins that make the skin or, this, or the hair or the bones. Like, for instance, for skin and hair, collagen and, uh, and, and hair protein. There are proteins that have to do with sensors, like hearing, seeing, and so on. And proteins that digest the food that we eat in order to get from it the um, components that can make new proteins. So, so when uh, you hear it's good to eat, to eat proteins in eggs, in milk, in steaks, in fish, or whatever you, you have, these proteins do not grow in our body. Means when we eat eggs, we don't, grow, we don't make a chicken in our, and so on. The eggs, the proteins from the eggs are being consumed, they are being chopped by other proteins called enzymes, in order to make the proteins that the body needs that meaning. So here you have some more uh, examples. I talked about most of them, hemoglobin and enzymes. There are storage proteins. There are an antibodies and so on. So as I say, they performed almost all cellular functions for human or for mammalian, breathing, digestion, muscle motion, we didn't talk about muscle, I should have mentioned it earlier because it's connected to the program that we are now today with St. Georgie. And those responsible for, uh, for functioning under pressure, like 
heat or cold shocks, immune response, organ failures like heart. I'm sure that some of you met a person that said, oh, I had a heart problem, I had a heart problem. And the ambulance came and he went to the hospital, but the doctor looked at him and said, yes, you had a problem, but you, take, you took care of it on your own. There are cases like this. These are done by two specific proteins that are made exactly when the problem starts. Because we don't need these proteins unless there is a heart problem, surely not at the age of one or two. Uh, dust in the eye, maybe I will talk about it a little later, but the, the tear that comes with the, when dust goes into the eye, the tear has a protein that can chop the uh, membrane of any uh, bacteria that can be together with the dust. So that's really, all these are interesting. In nature, we didn't need this here. Later, let me do this one. In nature, structure means function. So I think that this, this example is really good. You, you can see here two paper clips. And I'm sure that you know what paper clips do. They keep together several pages. Now, I myself made, the, uh, played with it and got to different fold. You can see here, you can see here. It's the same material. I didn't boil it, I didn't cut it, I didn't do. This cannot do the, the job that this do. So this is what happens in nature, and proteins that you can see here, an example, work the same way. So this is a protein, it's made of atoms. I hope that all of you know what atoms are and that are all materials are made of atoms. The atoms that make proteins are here. And this is where the protein is active. The rest is keeping it together. So it's called active site, this group here, groove here. And in order to look at it more carefully and explain, I rotated it and zoomed. This is the same position. And here there is also a substrate of this protein. This protein is a chopper, it cuts here. So the substrate, this khaki thing, must be in place and must be on the right size. It means the active site is tailored according to the substrate. So if the substrate was a little bit larger, it wouldn't fit. And if it was a little bit smaller, maybe it fitted, but it would be floppy and probably not cut too correctly. This is what I mean, structure and function are connected. Proteins are long chains made of amino acids. Hopefully you know what it is, but if not, there are 20 types. And the fold of each protein, which is carefully designed for fulfilling the function, as I showed a minute ago, is determined by the sequence of the amino acids. So there are 20 types, but the sequence of them in the protein determine the structure. Proteins are usually of about 150, 300, 400 amino acids. So let's have a look at it. 20 amino acids. All have the same backbone, and I drew it here like, like Lego, like puzzle. Each has a different side chain. The side chain gives either the uh, chemical uh, properties, chemical nature, or it's a tool. If this protein has to chop or to, to put together, it's a tool. So I don't know to, to draw chemical tools. So I drew a tool that represents them. So this uh, puzzle comes together. And now I didn't draw anything except for the tools, and it grows larger and larger, but it wears nothing unless it's folded together correctly and has an active site, which here is this, is part of it. So all of this was known when I started my scientific life. It was known or just found, but not how. Not how this, this uh, coming together, this connection between them is being made. This was not known. And many groups, many very good laboratories try to find out how it works. When I started, they 
main idea was that it won't be possible, but uh, still it, I was interested in it, and only thing I knew is, if we find out how it works, we will have a big smiley. <laughs> not, not very, not doubts and not skepticism, but a big smiley. So let me tell you about the smiley. Uh, as I say, there are 20 types of amino noises. The sequence determines the fold. What determines the sequence? The sequence is determined by DNA, by the genetic code. Each protein has a gene coding for it, and the sequence in the genetic code determines the sequence in the protein. So there are four bases. The whole genetic code is four letters. Until now, I am uh, very, very excited about this. Four letters all your life, ladies and gentlemen. By four letters, all the flowers, all the fish, all the cockroaches, all the elephants, all bacteria, just same four letters. Isn't it uh, exciting? This was found out when I was about your age. And these four letters have the instructions for each amino acid. Each amino acid from the 20 amino acids, sorry, is coded by three of the four letters, which are called codons. So each amino acid has a codon, which are three out of the four. That's all. Seems very simple. But anyway, the translation of the genetic code to proteins is not only translation, but also different language. Four letters language to 20 letters language. So this is DNA. I hope that all of you know it. And I allow myself to tell you a joke, if you're going to hear a joke. When I ask young, young students, young kids, much younger than you, in grammar school, seven, eight years old, do you know what is DNA? Oh, they say, of course we know. This is the tool that the police uses to identify criminals. <laughs> so even kids, very young kids, know what is DNA. And we will not talk now about criminals and police. Just have a look. The DNA is made as a double helix of two strains, and they are connected by these ladders, like, uh, the, like lines, like steps in a ladder. Each line is made of two components. These are the letters, four letters. Just look at the colors, just four colors. And the, and the um, lines here, the base pairing here, each of them is a base, so base pairs are a, one long and one short. I won't go into the chemistry, but this is all. Actually, four letters in two types of pairs. That's all. Now, this is here is the information. And this information is not, a, not available, cannot be read, because it is masked by, by, by the DNA itself. So the first thing that happens, the DNA is being transcribed to a molecule which is very similar to it called RNA. For this particular case, it's messenger RNA because the message of the genetic code is in it. This is transcription. So part of this is being, uh, is being uh, transcribed to this, to this molecule. RNA and DNA are very similar. The, uh, the difference is in the backbone, ribonucleic acid, and their oxyribonucleic acid. Again, messenger RNA has four, just four bases, three of them are identical to DNA, and one rather similar to it, but not exact. The information from here is being translated to proteins by the machinery, by a molecular machine called the ribosome. And this is what I wanted to understand. How does the ribosome work? So I want to show you how clever is the ribosome. Here is messenger RNA, four letters. You can see, I hope even with this uh, presentation, yellow, red, green, and purple. That's it. And this, we know that each three of them are coding for one, one amino acid. This comes to the ribosome, to the factory, to the um, molecular machine that does it. Where to start? Where are the triplets? If, it, if a string like this would come to me, I won't know what, a, 
where are the triplets. And if, if I decide about a triplet, this determines all the triplets. So for instance, maybe this is the triplet. This is the first step. If this is the triplet, this is the second triplet, the third triplet, and so on. But also this could be a triplet. And also this. What is right? Two are wrong. Which one is right? Again, if I had to, to decide, I don't know how. But the ribosome knows, and it knows where to start. Which one? It knows first, sorry, how to assign the triplet, and then where to start. This is the second, the second step. Where to start? So there is, there is some language within the messenger that tells it, but it has to know to read it. So here is, here is the, the triplets are already shown. I put these uh, uh, blocks above them. And where is the second, the first one? So it finds the first one. It binds to the codons by anticodon. This is the molecule that brings it, that bring, brings the amino acid. We, we'll talk about it in a minute, but it's called tRNA. From one point, it can make codon-anticodon interactions at exactly uh, according to the rules within DNA. And from the other side of it, it carries the amino acid that is coded by this free. So it binds, but not in the air. It binds on the ribosome by one a step, which happens on the ribosomal small subunit. This, this is the clever subunit because it a, accommodates the RNA and also makes, provides the possibility for decoding. And the peptide bond, the bond that binds the amino acid, which is called peptide bond, is made on the other side of the ribosome and the large subunit. So this is the clever one, and this, these are the head, hands. All ribosomes are universal and function in a very similar way in all cells, regardless of the source. So the ribosome of the bacteria the ribosome of the elephant and the ribosome of the fish, and of us, work the same way. What does it mean? It, it translates the code and makes the protein the same way. It can have a little bit different structure or larger structure in, in mammalian, but it works the same way. Ribosome is the largest component of the cell, but there still there are a huge number of ribosomes that function in every li living cell. And mammalian cells may host millions of ribosomes at the same time. In the liver, they can reach five, six millions. Even bacteria, 80,000, 100,000, when they grow, ribosomes work all the time. So we think that the ribosome is a factory. The factory that gets the uh, instructions linearly, this is the messenger RNA that goes into the, into the factory and being read inside it. And the amino acids are being brought by trucks, if it's factory, you see, they have, they have uh, wheels. But actually what I'm showing you now is tRNAs that have on one side the anticodon and from the other side, the cognate amino acids. They go all into the factory. And here, there will be a new bond, the protein that would be made in here like that inside. They'll come out from one side, the other side of the ribosome. They, while, while one bond is being made, the message continues goes in triplet, and the empty trucks are going to look for a new, new uh, job. And as I said earlier, there are two parts, a small one where the, the recognition and the decoding happens, and the large one with the bond is being made, and all needs energy, but not much. So they are fully universal. Now, I want to show you where, how we think they work. We made the movie, we made this movie, well, 12 years ago, based on our, our results and results from other labs that we could uh, connect to, together. 
It, 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 it is available on YouTube, and so far, nobody complained. So I think that they are right. When I said uh, that I incorporated studies from, or results from many labs, it means if at one functional state the ribosome was like this, and in another one it was like this, I had the guts to say, I identified the hinge, and I had the guts to say that it goes this way. But of course it could have gone this way. So this does not fit with efficient work, and I had the guts to do this. Later on, there were structures in between, and it was proven to be correct. So the motions that you see here are a, sometimes com completely experimental, and sometimes iteration between several experiments. We did it together with a student of art from the Hebrew, from, sorry, from Jerusalem Arts, Art Academy. So they mainly decided about colors. They said the cell should be green. So here you are. Now we, this is the messenger RNA with the code, and it comes to the small subunit. And it goes around its lower part, narrow part here. You see that it took it. And here there are factors that are bound to the two parts of the ribosome. Now we, we look only at the small one, which are called initiation factors. Their task is to tell the ribosome start. And they are not in the ribosome, they are part of the cell. Actually, this one, which is initiation factor number three, was my first uh, uh, target to, to understand how it works, which I did before ribosomes. And maybe we'll come back to it later. I want to tell you until now, this target, the structure of this target is known, but only on the ribosome. Okay, but anyway, now the messenger comes in, wraps around, and IF3, initiation free, make sure that it's in place. Once it's bound, the first tRNA, the first truck can come by another initiation factor. And now the two initiation factors Make sure everything is fine. You can see now the tRNA in its position, its, its translation position, it's called P. Maybe I'll come back to it, maybe not, with the amino acid. And once all this is okay, the large subunit can come and make bridges, chemical bridges between them. Now the binding between the two of them is perfect and it can start working. So we look at it now from the solvent point, point of view, the large subunit closer to us, the small subunit behind. The tRNAs come with amino acids, come in. They are brought by elongation factors. Here the decoding, and here the peptide bond is being made. The bond between the new, the new amino acid and the growing protein called peptide bond in the large subunit. And this goes on, and you see the ribosome really helps. Chemically, it's amazing. Now I took away the large subunit, so you can see just how the bond is being made, how fast it's being made, and that the newly born protein comes out through a tunnel that protects it and so on. Now you see the, again the whole ribosome with the hands in, out, in, out, in, out, and the protein becomes long, long enough that it can come out of the, of the tunnel and fold correctly because it has to, sometimes with help of chaperones. And the tRNAs, the empty ones, go out and look for other job. When there is a codon that says stop, instead of tRNA comes this gold thing, this one, which is a factor, two factors, release factor and recycling factor. And they let the two subunits separate. The protein go, goes to wherever it needed, folded, and the um, tRNAs look for a new job. That's the whole story. Isn't it simple? Took 20 years. So just for uh, impressing you, the ribosome is made of, the ri bacterial ribosome is made of quarter of a million atoms. And we know the position of each and every one. It's many components. This is the small subunit on the left. And this is the, the large subunit. 
you can see whoever is interested, it's made, the ribosome is also made of RNA, ribosomal RNA, which is two thirds of its uh, molecular weight, and many proteins, each of the proteins is in a different color. This is, this is the story for bacterial ribosomes, and this is the structure. I just want to tell you that the ribosome act continuously. They form five to 40 new bonds in one second and hardly make mistakes. Mistake rate that we can catch, that we can identify is one to a million. I think that it makes many, many more mistakes, but it has a proofreading machinery that gets rid of the mistakes before we see them. So what we see in the, in, in the newly born proteins is one to a million. I was a good student. I made, I, in second year, they asked us to make a peptide bond. So I needed six hours for one bond. It makes 40 in one second. I needed six hours and a mistake rate of 50% was acceptable. Now, the time takes only. Chemistry developed, so there is only two hours are needed and mistake rate of 10% but it's still nothing compared to the ribosome itself. So let's talk a little about giants. You see here uh, intellectual giants, musical giants, writers, great people. What is common to all of them, except that they were giants? They're all dead, and they all died very young. You can see they are the... the a duration of their, of their life is written here. Mozart didn't even reach 40 years. Orwell, 47. Very young. So this is one thing that is common to them. The second thing that is common to them is that they died before or in the middle of last century. And from what? From infectious diseases. All of them. Do, an example for an infection disease? pneumonia, that today is completely curable, and so on. Why do I talk about them? Because in the middle of last century, antibiotics went into use, uh, clinical use. So maybe if Orwell could stay another few years away alive, he would be treated with antibiotics, but it was, did not happen. Antibiotics are used to recover from infectious diseases. The natural antibiotics are the weapons that bacteria from one type use for, against interfering another type. These are the bullets of the bacterial life. They are made by microorganisms, at least the natural antibiotics. Because of the fundamental role played by the ribosome, almost half of the useful antibiotics clinically useful antibiotics, target the ribosome. So now you remember ribosome is a factory. Factory that works like a, a line, assembly line. If you stop one, one uh, step, you stop everything, correct? And that's the way that the antibiotics paralyze the ribosome. So antibiotics molecular weight is less than a thousand, usually more like five, six hundred. Bacterial ribosomes, those that bring the, the, the diseases, pathogenic bacteria, they're all about two and a half million. So how come these little ones paralyze the giant ribosome? Exactly what I said earlier, they, they hit specific points. Answering this question was even beyond my dreams, expectations. I thought maybe there will be a smiley that will show how the ribosome works. But how antibiotics with such small size compared to this huge one, I didn't expect. So my bonus is that we determined how all the antibiotics, the target ribosomes, how all of them are working. And I want to show some examples. So first, as I said earlier, most of them bind to uh, functional sites. So you see here the large and the small subunit, the skeleton of them. And these balloons, these balls, are showing where antibiotics bind. So in the large subunit and in the small subunit, 
they bind either to the decoding site or to sites that allow the dynamic in the decoding and in the large one where peptide bond is being made or where the hinge between open and closed hands is just there. Very simple, very clever. So instead of speaking too much, I'll show you four examples, and this is also available on YouTube. YouTube is allowed in Hungary. No? It is. <laughs> well, not in China. So now you, you will see four, four examples that are based on the first one. Here, this one, at the end, all what it does, it sits in the path of the messenger. That's all. Just block the path. You don't have to be big for this. You just have to sit in the right position. Tetracycline, which is uh, more useful, it sits in the position of the second track, the second tRNA. Just blocks the position, occupies it. Just in, in one, one tRNA is not sufficient. The third one that you will see is erythromycin, and erythromycin came in to use the first one from ribosomal antibiotics, and it sits in the tunnel in the tunnel through which the protein goes out. So a little protein can be made, five bonds, but the tunnel is blocked. And the last one is clindamycin. And clindamycin, what? In, in my opinion, is the cleverest chemically. So look, it sits just in the boat, in between the two parts of the boat. That's it, it found the, this fantastic piece of So problems with antibiotic usage. The distinction between patient and pathogenic bacteria, we want to kill the, the bacteria, the pathogens, not the patients. That's uh, really important. We don't even want the patients to suffer, but at least not to kill them. And I'll tell you in a minute why it's important. And the second, oops, sorry. Uh, let's start with this. I say that all ribosomes are very similar and work the same way. So we have to distinct between the patients and the, and the pathogens. And how is this happening? They are highly, the functional sites, as I said earlier, it's highly conserved. And clinical usage must have separation between bacteria and, and human. And even, how it, does it work? Even in the very highly conserved parts, there are subtle differences, very small differences. Even if it's highly conserved, I want to show you one. So what you see here is a section perpendicular to the tunnel long axis, like this. And in gray are the tunnel walls. And inside, all these are positions of many antibiotics from the macrolide family. The macrolide family are the daughters and granddaughters of erythromycin that you saw a minute ago. So these are all of these. And I won't go one by one. The erythromycin is in red, but all of them block the tunnel. Some block excellent, some just very, very good, and some just good, but all block. And what is common to all of them, they interact with one specific nucleotide here, which is adenine, what A, and its running number is 2058. Now there are 4,500 uh, bases, so this is base number 2058. And it's adenine, it's A in all bacteria. I want to show you how, I just focus on how this interacts with, for instance, erythromycin. So this is erythromycin and this is adenine 2058. You cannot see it here, but you can take my word. The affinity here, the chemical affinity here, is just excellent. Now I want, ladies and gentlemen, have a look, focus on here. And you will see the difference between bacteria and us, between pathogenic bacteria and us. Oops, that's all. From A 
to G, and all the addition is this. So I don't want to go into chemistry, but it's less than a promile of the ribosome uh, molecular weight. Just this, bacteria and us. But when there is, this position is occupied, the distance between this and erythromycin is too short, and it kicks it out. That's it, that's all. The difference, pay attention, the difference between bacteria and us. Only this. This to this. So this is the way there is distinction between bacteria and human or <coughs> patients. Let's talk for a minute about another problem, and this is much bigger than the distinction. It's resistance. Resistance to antibiotics that became very bad, very severe problem in our days in modern medicine. So bacteria know to make way, to find ways to resist to them, the pathogenic bacteria. And let me show you one of, of the, of the uh, ways. One of them is to take advantage of these little differences and modify their own genome. Have a look. Let, we can look at here. So here, you remember this and you remember this. This is the normal uh, way pathogenic bacteria are. And this is why it doesn't bind to us. This is the basis for selectivity. It's also the basis for acquiring antibiotic resistance. By modifying this position, mutation in this position, so it goes like this, it goes from A to G, no binding. Resistance. Bacteria, they live between 10 minutes to four or five hours. This is their multiplication time. Normal bacteria, maybe something a little bit longer sometimes, six hours, seven. But anyway, even six hours, they have four generations in one day. We need, for four generations, 100 years. So in one day, they multiply themselves four times, and they can make many mutations. In three months, thousands of mutations. This mutation that survive is resistant. So they, they can afford this, and that's the way they acquire resistance in this particular case. There are many others. We, we are not going to discuss all. Can we combat resistance to antibiotics? So in my opinion, and I'm very mm, pessimistic, only partially. Uh, the reason is, why partially, partially? The reason is that bacteria want to live what does it mean, want to live? They can make many mutations. I just explained it a minute ago. So in, in a street world, is want to live, but in genetic world, is able to mutate themselves until they exist. So the mutations that survive, these are the resistance ones. What can we do? We cannot do much, but we can try to look for compounds that they have additional uncores, we can try to look for compounds that made from several components. We can try to use cocktails. And I will talk now only about one way, which is the synergism. Synergism is that one part is enforcing the other. The synergism, the synergetic uh, antibiotic that is natural, is based on the, on the proximity of several functional site. So what you see here rotating is the large subunit, the RNA is in gray and the proteins in green. And here in color, you can see three positions. Chloramphenicol shows where peptide bond is being made, it's called PTC. Clindamycin, you remember the clever uh, antibiotic that goes into the, into the bond. And erythromycin sits in the tunnel. Look how, how close they are to each other. So nature produced a pair that blocks the tunnel and the active site wonderfully. So what you see here is the walls of the tunnel. Here is one and here is second. The two components that they block fully. Each of them blocks the other from going out. 
So they are uh, just fantastic, aren't they? Uh, the name of this compound is Sinner Seed. It's being sold. It's, uh, it didn't catch very well, uh, although it's already more than 10 years, even in America. Because first, it's expensive. Second, it's somewhat uh, poisoning. But the idea is great. I, when I saw it, I became from here to here. Insane. I had hopes. I'm a chemist, so I thought about chemical combination between the two of them. I was not the only one that thought, and uh, um, many others did. This didn't work for, because of many reasons, but at least I didn't have to try it. Instead, we identified another pair, a much smaller one, and we are now trying to enforce it. So this is our little, little uh, contribution that we are trying to do for uh, fighting antibiotics. So this is actually what is written here. In the last minute, I want to go back to what you asked me to do. How did we start and how did we work and how did we kept going? So I told you that when we started, almost everything was known. It was known that there is genetic code. It was known that proteins are according to it. Ribosomes were known and they, they were known to do it, but not how. This, this is what I showed in the beginning. Uh, when I said, in the beginning of the 80s that I want to understand the structural basis. It means to understand all what I showed you until now. People said, oh, you must be kidding. But actually, they didn't, f they didn't care if I'm kidding or not. They laughed at me. This was the way to say, ah, it's impossible. And everything is already known. And it's a black box. And all types of uh, discouraging uh, things, discouraging in order to understand, the, to see what I showed you, we need crystallography. I really don't want to explain what it is, just to give you a, an overview. The reason for crystallography is that there is no microscope that can show distances between atoms. You see here all types of microscopes. But the best they can see is a big protein or a bacteria. And in order to see distances between atoms, we are using X-rays. Not in a microscope, there are no lenses, but there is diffraction. So if you look at this picture, and please disregard the red and the green and the pink, just look at the white line here, which is the X-ray beam. And this point where there is a, a, should be a crystal, and the arrows. And you see that the arrows go, are, are uh, diffracted to all sides, and with all types of lengths. The length symbolizes the intensity. So according to mathematical rules, it's called Fourier transform. If we know all these, uh, all these vectors and we can combine them together, we can work back the structure by back Fourier transform. The compounds know what is Fourier transform, so they are, they are diffracting it. So we need crystals, which are a, a, can be described as fully, fully periodic entities to three dimensions, one, two, and three. We need X-rays to get diffraction. We need a microscope to connect, to collect, merge all the diffractions in 360 degrees. We need a crystallographer. This little person here, this is a crystallographer that has to know how to do this and to know much mathematics. At the end, we get uh, maps, which are electron density maps. We see where many electrons are, and then if we understand it and it's correct, we can work out the structure. This is the story. But we need crystals, and as I said, crystals are entities with periodicity in three dimensions. Sodium chloride, I hope that you all know what it is. You, love, you like chemistry, don't you? Sodium and chloride, just two atom molecules that loves to crystallize. You buy the salt for the kitchen, it's already crystals, small crystals. Proteins can also be crystallized already in the 60s. A 
actually earlier in the 40s, there were proteins that were crystallized. This is lysozyme, the protein that is in the tear that can chop cell walls. It was crystallized first in Oxford and was repeated by a sixth grader, so it can be done. But these guys, this, huh? now you know that they are not very stable. So when I started, there was a big question mark, but as I told you, it was a meaning no, not possible. And this is because many, many good groups, good scientific groups, tried to crystallize it. And they explained why they failed. There were papers saying that ribosomes can be considered as non-crystallizable. This is part of their properties. They have high degree of internal mobility. You saw it's correct. Considerable flexibility. You saw, now we know it's correct. Functional heterogeneity. It means sometimes like this way, this way, that way. This is heterogeneous function. It's correct. Chemical complexity is correct. Large size, it's correct. But one property that they paid less attention to was the marked tendency to deteriorate, which in my opinion was the important property. When ribosomes are being prepared even very well, only half of them are active. It means most of the others have already been damaged. And I thought that this is a problem because you cannot make a fully fully uh, repeating or fully um, periodic packing if some of your samples are so and some of the particles are so and some of the particles don't have it at all. So this was, in my opinion, the problem. And why did I have a guts to, to go into something that was known to be impossible and I was just a very young scientist because I had the chance, I can tell you later why, but I had the chance to read a popular per, a document about the bears, the winter sleep of the bears. When the bears go to sleep in, in the beginning of the winter, they'll get up it after winter is over, four or five months. And a delegation went to the North Pole to see what happens to them. And they found all types of things. Side finding for them was that the ribosomes are ordered in, in uh, layers, fully periodic layers, in the inner side of the membranes of every cell. So can you, ima can you imagine me reading it? Every bear, every winter, every cell, it works. Ah, it didn't work for people, so what? Even if they have more experience, the bears do this, or it happens to the bears. So I thought, why is it? And in my opinion, it is connected to, to the f situation or to the fact that at the end of the winters, the bears get up. And they have to do, they want to do a lot of things they didn't do well while they were asleep, so they need proteins, because proteins do almost everything. And for this, they need ribosomes. So the packing, in my opinion, was that, that it keeps the ribosomes from deteriorating. Uh, I was not the only one that read this or, or similar uh, report. There was a group in, in Cambridge and in the United States, in Italy, and they thought, ah, this shows that cold, cold uh, drop in temperature causes packing of the ribosome. So they took fertilized eggs of chicken, of lizard, normal eggs, put them in the fridge, and within 15 minutes they had the ribosomes organized. But it's was on the membrane and only one layer, so it was not real crystals. And I wanted real crystals, and not of bears, not of, cock not of uh, lizards, not of chicken. I wanted of bacteria that can resemble pathogens. So I thought that not only cold, every stre stress, stress should in induce periodic packing in ribosomes. This is what I thought. And therefore, I looked for bacteria, or for ribosomes from bacteria, that live under harsh conditions always. You don't have to read it all just here. I thought that if the bacteria lives in hot springs, in nuclear facilities, in the Dead Sea, they must be strong. And the ribosomes will be also less, less uh, 
falling apart or less deteriorating. So I want to show you, for those of you that did not see the Dead Sea, this is an aerial of it. It's very salty. You see the salt comes out? It's in Israel, the lowest part in the world. In the summer it can reach 60, 65 degrees centigrade outside. Winter is a little bit less. But anyway, have a look from close. It's dead. Do you see one flower, one tree, one mar something, the water, no fish, nothing. And this, this is salt. This is not, uh, this is not snow. This is salt. Never snow there. And, and this is the sea. So in this sea, although it's called Dead Sea, and although real animals were not found, two bacteria and one algae were identified in the 70s by professors from the Hebrew University. And I want to show you. You see here a colony on the salt. In the winter, it was, it was covered, but there was evaporation. You can see many colonies, actually. You can see here. So what you see in this picture is the distance between beginning of the winter, uh, after the, the rain. There is no rain there, but the rain comes from the mountains. You see there are mountains around. This is actually Jordan. Israel is on that side. Uh, from here to here, 70 centimeters of evaporation in one winter, and bacteria still there. It's a pinky, pink bacteria. So I thought that this bacteria should have strong ribosomes and so on. And indeed, they, we found another, par, another uh, um, partner for us, another good source, Dinococcus radiodurans, which in my opinion are really fantastic. First of all, their uh, sequence is similar to pathogens. Not the halobacteria, those from the Dead Sea are, are, are here, a bit different. Second, they can live under every extreme condition you have in your head. Hot, cold, hunger, irradiation, they can be irradiated and they are still there. So we use them, mainly them for seeing how antibiotics bind. And we did, did these crystals, but I just want to tell you what was the reaction in the world when I told them that I want to work on ribosomes from extremophiles. Even my collaborator from Berlin that was very supportive said, extremophile, why not E. coli that everybody likes? This is again this crazy, demanding, dreaming lady. But uh, it worked. Look, it worked. We have crystals. We have 25 different crystal forms, and some of them are suitable for crystallography. So we started in January 1980, actually the last week of December 79, but let's give up on that. And six years later, we went to measure them. And we, we cannot measure in normal sources. We need facilities, synchrotrons. This is a synchrotron in Grenoble. A really beautiful, huh? between the rivers, this is the synchrotron, all green, the mountains still have snow, just beautiful, beautiful place. And it works according to the following, there is a, a acceleration here of particles, and the particles run around in this very large ring. And on the ring, in the tangential, they are measuring, measuring uh, stations, like this one is measuring crystallography, for crystallography of, of biological crystals. And this is Frank, he is now measuring. So we came there really happy. We had already a paper in Journal of Molecular Biology and above and beyond my dreams. Six years after we started, and we got just fantastic, fantastic uh, diffraction. Actually, this diffraction was not, not uh, obtained in this one, but I thought that this picture is nicer, so I, it's, the same, it's the same principle. It was uh, obtained in, uh, in uh, chess, in uh, Cornell University in the United States. You see how beautiful it is? There are spots. It goes all the way to the side. It means these are the arrows that went far. All the spots can be measured. 
just wonderful, wonderful. We did not expect any, anything here. Oh, you had to see the students. I was there six years, but they were two or three years depending. Oh, 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 oh. Just, just no way to describe their happiness. For about a second or two, this was the second picture. You see, all the, all the information that we want disappeared. The crystal was gone, damaged, decayed. By the, by the irradiation. So how did we feel? How did the students feel? They, we came from here. The crystallization was like climbing an average. So we, oops, Everest. We climbed the Everest, and we climbed, and we climbed, and we reached the top, just in order to see that the real, the real Everest is behind, is here. That we have to reach here, in order to measure what we have. Crystals was one Everest, but not the real one. And this could have been, should have been much more difficult. So this was a, a minute of depression, big depression. After a ha-ha-ha, that held about a, a second. We repeated this experiment in many places around the world. And after we got it more than two, three hundred times, we knew this is gone. So we could either stop or look for the Look for the result, uh, look for the reason. And in my opinion, the reason was that uh, X-rays cut the, the bonds, the chemical bonds within the ribosomes, between the crystals. And the atoms that were in the bond are unhappy, so they run around in the crystal to look for compensation. And we should stop their, their movement by cooling, by lowering the temperature, not giving them energy. So this was also considered impossible. Here is the experiment in Stanford in 1986. This is me. You see my face? You think that I look here very, uh, very sure? Let's call it like this. I, I uh, collaborated with Hakon Hope that was uh, considered more crazy than I was, so it's okay. We were a good couple. And Ron Levy, who is a Doctor in Stanford came and told us that he doesn't think it will work. But, ladies and gentlemen, this is the result. Look. So, we started the experiment at, in, on Friday in the middle of the day. We got the first diffraction at midnight. And we could repeat it after a second, after two seconds, after five seconds, after an hour, after two hours, no decay. You can imagine now the students that uh, instead of uh, crying, being, be, really being happy. But actually, in this experiment, there were no students, only me and Hakon and Christoph Kratke from Austria. This was Friday night. I, I want to tell you a few seconds what happened later. Within a few hours, we started to get telephone calls from Europe, and then within Saturday from America. No email at that time, and we didn't have a phone that goes overseas. So all of a sudden, we get a call from Cambridge. Is it true the crystals don't decay? Is it true the crystals don't die? And then during the day from America, and one of them, a good friend of mine, when I say it's true the crystals don't die, you know what he said? Is somebody more reliable to verify what you're telling or that you're not dreaming? So the reason that they knew about it is that the Scientific Advisory Committee of Stanford were standing in balconies around with magnifying glasses. And when they saw us jumping, it was after midnight Friday weekend, they assumed that we are OK. So within four months, it became uh, the routine, the routine uh, procedure in the whole world. Just four months, the whole world went into it. I think that now most of the students don't know even to measure differently. So if you look here. This is the year, this is the number of structures. And we, we know the number because each structure that is, that is con uh, determined has to be deposited in the protein data bank, which is an international facility. So this is the situation in end of uh, 86, 87. And this is today, 80,000 structures, almost all of them at cryotemperature. 
and almost all of them from crystals that couldn't diffract at otherwise, too small, too fragile, to this, to that, and almost all of them with medical or, or a functional or material reported. So two, two more things happened at the same time uh, in crystallography, which I, cannot, which I cannot explain. Maybe one of them I can, better detectors, the CCD, which are now in every camera, in every cell phone, but at that time just introduced. So this is what is called cryobiocrystallography. And you see my face 20 years later? Much happier than when we installed it. Now my face is not so important. I just wanted to, that you see that now uh, cryobiocrystallography cryo is performed everywhere in, this, in the world. And there is a company, that, several companies that sell it. And this is the machinery. Looks relatively simple. So some credits, the Weizmann Institute let me work even when I was considered dreamer. They, and I had hardly any result. President was Michael Seller, and his successor was Chaim Arari. And he was a immunologist, but he was a physicist, and he didn't change the decision to let me work. I, I didn't have very good working conditions, but I had my corner, and nobody disturbed me, so I could work on ribosomes. The Scientific Advisory Committee, uh, Sir John Kendrew, maybe some of you remember, and Chris Anfinsen, can you determine the first structure, hemoglobin, first protein structure? And uh, Anfinsen showed that proteins need structure, and the structure is determined by the sequence. They both Nobel Prize laureates, and they die. Alex Rich, still alive at MIT, he worked with Jim Watson, did the DNA, in Caltech for almost 10 years just trying to crystallize ribosomes, and they failed. Yet, when I got the crystals, he was very supportive. It all started with a very strong collaboration with Max Planck in Berlin. This is Dr. Wittmann that was the director. After we got the first diffraction, Max Planck and the German government put together a research unit for us in the synchrotron in Hamburg. Wittmann died 10 years before the structures, and it, he was replaced by Franceschi and then Fuccini. So I had two research one in Hamburg and one in Israel working in parallel. And I'm thankful for both of them because during the whole time they were always very determined and very devoted. So I want to show you the, the group in Hamburg that was closed, terminated 10 years ago. The, the TAs, the technicians say that only, only angels can wear the ribosomes. You can see them here. All of them came to Israel to the Dead Sea to look for bacteria. They had better time. And here is how we went to measure, for instance, in Cornell. This is the group in Israel that is still functioning. Some of the people here that are very important for the, for the project have already left us, but they are here. For instance, this morning, we discussed his work and Davidovich. I want now to talk to the young female here, young women young students that may have hesitations. Shall they go to science or not? Because most of the society says that girls, women, cannot do this. To be a good mother and a good housewife and a good scientist, it's difficult, maybe impossible. I'm sure that, this, that you get this type of waves from the neighborhood, from your community, from your family, from whatever. So pay attention, except for me. Anat, Anat Bashan, Dr. Anat Bashan is the chief scientist. She's a fantastic, fantastic scientist. She has three children. Ella, who is also a fantastic scientist, has only two children. But they both love their children and the children like them. Raz has three children, but he doesn't count. He's a man, so let's forget him. <laughs> Tamar. Tamar came to us 15 years ago for 10 weeks. She really liked it. And stayed. She was a young, young girl when she came. Now she's a mother of three. But what I want to show you is not that. I want to show you that I took this picture the day that she had birthday. And she baked a cake. So until now I showed you that scientists can be women, can be mothers. Now they can make cakes. You want to see her cake? Look at her cake. <laughs> so it shows in my group the cake, the ribosomes are considered sweet. 
I also want to thank my family. I show here only my daughter, who is an MD, and granddaughter, who grew the crystals of lysozyme. Uh, not all, it's, my father died when I was uh, young, but my mother, my sister, and all the others supported me very, very, um, um, in a very nice way. I want to thank them, and I want to show you something. My granddaughter in Paris, when I got a prize, she says, she wrote this speech on her own. I am Ada's granddaughter. As you know, she is a very busy scientist, but she always finds time for me. That she wrote on her own. I didn't tell her to write it. It was a surprise for me. And she gave me a prize. I want to show you her prize. But what, the reason you brought me here is Nobel. I heard it many times today. The prize that I want to show you is at least as good, maybe even more important for me. The grandma of the year is Ada Yunat. <laughs> And when I asked her which year, every prize has a year. Which year? Huh? You have to reprove yourself every year. <laughs> and the minute you fail, I'll take it off the wall. So first of all, see it's off the wall already nine years. It was before the Nobel. And second, this is the only prize I have that I have to reconfirm every year. Everything else is, when it's given, it's given. So, uh, Ribosomes became popular. This is a carnival. He is me. She is a ribosome. You see, protein comes out of her. Even young children. And this is what happened to me by a, an artist that never met me. But have a look. Small subunit, a large subunit, and he thinks that he knows about a new antibiotic. Thank you very much.